welcome everybody uh, who is joining us tonight in this uh, collaboration between the International Literacy Association, uh, Wizards of the Coast, and our esteemed colleagues here in the space. Uh, my name is Dr. Earl Aguilera. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction at California State University, Fresno, uh, here on the ancestral land of the Yokuts and Mono peoples. Um, my teaching, research, and writing focuses mostly on interactive media, mostly um, games and such these days, along with some work in uh, digital literacy and critical pedagogy. Um, I previously taught high school English language arts and was a K-12 reading specialist uh, in a previous life. Before we get too deep into our conversation this evening, uh, we're going to share a video uh, that our event sponsor, Wizards of the Coast, has prepared to give just a little bit of a background on how D&D is being used at schools. So I'm going to ask uh, Wes, our uh, local technomancer, to please conjure us uh, that vision of D&D and how uh, using that game along with great teaching is helping change lives. Hello. My name is Zach Clay. I'm a professional dungeon master, and I help run an after-school D&D club. Dungeons & Dragons is a tabletop role-playing game created back in the 70s that's really become the grandfather of a lot of modern role-playing games and video games. In Dungeons & Dragons, players gather around a table to tell stories, roll dice, fight monsters, and cast magic spells. One player takes the role of the Dungeon Master. They're the one that controls the world. They come up with the story and the monsters that the other players have to fight. One of my favorite aspects of DMing is building the world, creating characters and NPCs, and it's kind of like an outlet for all these ideas. The dragon will use its turn to dash. It's no longer really focusing on you, it's trying to get to the crater as fast as possible. The other players at the table each control their own character, a team that works together to help each other get through that dungeon or encounter or fight off the monster that's been put in front of them. Dragon falling from sky. Yeah, uh, you can see the dragon and it's getting like larger every second. Oh, hold, no. hold on a moment and I'm going to zone out back to like the astral projection. Whether it's teamwork or collaboration, creativity, or even a bit of math, Dungeons and Dragons is the meeting point of all of these skills that these students work on every day. Something I really love in D&D is just doing all the math, honestly. A lot of this comes in handy for like classwork and homework where I need to consider more than just the single option that I tend to just revert to. When I was in middle school and high school, there was no D&D club here. When I came back to the school as an educator, I decided to run sessions of D&D for the students. Now we have this great club between both the middle school and the high school and an amazing creative outlet for these students. No matter what else is going on in the world around them, when a player comes to sit at the table, the rest of the world can disappear. You find yourself immersed in the story that's happening and playing a character that isn't yourself. You can take on a funny voice or become the hero in the story, and perhaps that's some of the best collaboration and creativity that they get to express even just in the short time that they sit at the table. You heal 11 hit points. I got into D&D, it's actually because of her actually. Just showed me some books, got me introduced to the characters, and from there I just kept on playing. <laughs> Once a person realizes that the main part of D&D is just sitting around a table with your friends, rolling dice and telling stories, it's pretty easy to get into. I'm going to step aside and actually allow our presenters to introduce themselves. Um, we'd love to hear, in particular, your name, your current position, and maybe just a little bit about what you're currently working on with your students. I'll go first. Okay, I'm Cade Wells. I've been using Dungeons and Dragons in school for 10 years. Um, I've been able to actually get enough research and evidence put forth where I've been um, fortunate enough to be able to play on Fridays, every Friday with my students for the last four years. Um, I've been teaching for 10 years, so I've been using D&D as long as I've been a teacher, and I've been playing D&D for 33 years, which is why I knew it was a great instructional tool. 
Um, I teach at a school uh, called Harrisburg North Middle School in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Cade Wells. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Cade. Sure. Hello, I'm Marianne Cullinan. I'm uh, here on Penacook land in New Hampshire, USA, and I'm a middle school enrichment teacher, which means I have everyone who's a square peg in a round hole, not just gifted and talented. Um, I'm also a PhD student who at Lesley University who is studying role playing games as pedagogy. And I have a 60 to 70 kid weekly D&D after school program that's all run by students. I use a lot of role playing games in my classroom. And next week, I'm going to be in Sweden talking about my research at the Transformative Play Initiative Conference. And I'm super psyched. And I'm really, really happy to be here. So hi, everybody. Getting, getting tons of love in the, in the chat, in the emotes. Thanks for your enthusiasm. I'll go next. Hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca West. Beck is fine. I like the short version. I'm here in Brisbane, Australia. This is one of our northern states known as the Sunshine State. And I'm here helping build a brand new school. So I'm hoping to bring my love of gamification and everything games based to this brand new school. And we're looking at uh, a combination of different things, not just things like tabletop uh, games, but uh, we're looking at integrating it into the learning and making sure students are highly engaged when they come to school. Uh, today I'm going to be reflecting on some of the experience I had bringing the, the values and fun of D&D into my classroom to engage students with writing, but it's also a bit of a personal hobby. I am absolutely a newbie compared to everyone else here today. So if anyone's sitting here going, I have no idea what this is and I'm just stepping into the waters, I'm the person for you. <laughs> Beck, I'm really glad you brought that up in your intro, right? Because I think a, a big thing that we're trying to stress in this particular episode of the webinar series um, is the the importance of recognizing you don't have to be an expert, right? Or a longtime player in the space. Uh, we all come at this, right? With different perspectives and different levels of experience. Um, and the important thing for us, right? Is that we're creating, uh, we're presenting information that is as inclusive to folks as possible. So listen, if y'all have questions in the chat, not sure how something works, or if we're making kind of very weird and obscure references, feel free to ask and I'm sure Right, I'm sure an audience member uh, or, or a long timer in the D and D community would be um, happy to answer. All right, um, I'd like to once again take this opportunity to thank our guests today, as well as everyone who joined us to take part in this event. And again, another reminder: the recording will be available in the next few days. LiteracyWorldwide.org/backslash/digital-events. And to all our presenters on behalf of ILA, thank you so much for uh, for being with us today. Um, let's jump in now to uh, just a quick intro slash review about what D&D is, in case folks aren't familiar with it, right? In case folks aren't aware. Um, so I, I think about Dungeons and Dragons in kind of three three different ways. And this comes from uh, uh, other, other games researchers who think about games uh, along the lines of play, and rules and culture. And D&D is all three of those things, right? So from a play perspective, D&D um, &D, or Dungeons and Dragons uh, is one kind of game uh, called a role-playing game. And, and role-playing games generally happen through collaborative storytelling. Right, as we learned in the video, one person takes on the role of the DM, the dungeon master, sometimes now known as the GM or the game master. Uh, and that person will begin with a little scenario. Uh, so for example, I, as the DM, um, might uh, tell my players that their characters, um, uh, Coleope, uh, Kika, and the Paladin Wells um, have arrived at the lair of the evil dragon sorcerer, Sobez. Um, Ika, who is the leader of our party, what, what would you like to do now that we have arrived at, at this lair? Oh, hands on the hips and I look around and I just take everything in with a deep breath and go, something's a brew. 
and I look around as in inquiringly thinking if others think the same thing as well. Mm. Just that look of intent. <laughs> as you as you take your breath, uh, the the faintest scent of smoke uh, wafts in for just just a moment, and then it passes. Uh, Calliope, what would you like to do? I I stretch at my eyes and I say, something's brewing. Is it coffee? I might smell in coffee because, oh God, I, that was a late night last night. Did you hear those sweet songs I was busting out for everybody? And almost, yeah. almost as if on cue, as you talk about the coffee and as you recount your night, uh, the scent gets stronger and stronger and sweeter and sweeter. Uh, the Paladin Wells, you notice something a little amiss. That smell doesn't feel natural to you. What would you like I make, to do? I would like to make fun of the bard for her late night of drinking and song while I was getting my rest back so I could repray for my spells. And I say, uh, there's a, clearly a foul dragon beyond the gates of this uh, cave. Okay. And then I Okay, Wells, when the people want you to play Freebird, you play Freebird, okay? Hey, I was having cocktails with you at the time, but I had the good sense to go to bed, Bard. I mean, let's talk about sense. I cast Shield of Faith. I walk into the darkness with my greatsword raised over my head, ready to do battle with whatever fiend this is, hoping that my party follows behind me. And as the Paladin Wells steps every time. forward... <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, as the Paladin Well steps forward, uh, the two of you who are still remaining outside, you hear the crunch of footsteps behind you. So we'll pause right here. And this is just an example, right, of, of what the scenario looks like and what 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 um, collaborative role play looks like. Now, full disclosure, I didn't tell anybody here what the scenario was going to be. I said we'd be doing some collaborative role play, but this is all off the cuff. This is all improvisational, including on my part, right? So that's the kind of cycle, right? Part of the cycle of D&D, of, of, um, &D, and that's kind of what it looks like. Um, now, when we talk about the rules of D&D, &D, a lot of what makes it a game um, unique to others is the way that you resolve conflicts, right? And the way that you resolve conflicts is typically with with these these guys, these little these little die right here. My autofocus is is struggling. Um, and typically those die will be uh, rolled against some kind of difficulty, right? That represents how hard the task or the challenge is. Um, so, for example, uh, if the Paladin Wells encounters uh, a creature uh, inside the dungeon and rolls, would you mind rolling uh, uh, Paladin Wells and letting us know how that goes? Perception? Initiative? Uh, just roll for attack. All right. I'm gonna, I, rolled, I rolled a 21 after modifiers. 21. Okay, so notice how the Paladin Wells mentioned modifiers. Those might come from a weapon that the Paladin has, uh, a skill that the Paladin has honed, but you add those modifiers to your die, right? There's the kids talking about math, right? To see how the outcome goes. And of course, it's a hit and your sword clashes um, with a living suit of armor uh, that you've just encountered in the hallway. Ooh, uh, so and too, and if for example, um, Coyope, recounting her performance the night before, um, had to please a particularly tough crowd. Those modifiers might actually be in the negative, right? Would you mind rolling uh, to see how well the crowd enjoyed your performance? Sure. It was a three. Okay. Five, so it was an eight. It was too many cocktails or maybe too much free bird. All right. And the crowd is silent there's no booing but there's no cheering either and that might even be the hardest thing for a performer because you don't really you can't gauge how things are going and you're not really sure what the next step is going to be right so there you go folks that's kind of the 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 conflict resolution piece of D D. Right? right points of damage by the way eight eight points of damage and look, we've got uh, a couple of things that folks are mentioning, right? Um, damage and initiative, um, uh, the stories that the, the students have told, and all of this represents a culture, right? A culture that is built up around Dungeons and Dragons and around role play. So yes, 
uh, the storytelling happens and sure the the die rolling happens mm -hmm. but as a good friend of mine and former dungeon master has always reminded me D, &D is not what's contained within the covers of a book it's the experience you create in front of you at a table right mm -hmm. so think about D, D as also right a kind of cultural phenomenon Earl, I would love to add in and just say, as a teacher, one of the things that I find some parents and some children have as a misconception is that all of the characters are like the Paladin Wells. And you, I, I teach middle school. I have kids who love to just fight things. But I also have kids who don't want to fight anything. They want to be the bard. They want to be charming. They want to do magic. And so there's a lot of flexibility within the game structure to be within whatever the community that you teach in or whatever you do um, will bear. So you can have games that are really nonviolent. You can have games that do all sorts of different kinds of things. You could build roller coasters, you can make soup taverns, you can do whatever you want. So I think that's really nice also. It's such an important point. Right. Um, and that's why when we when we teach D and D to others, we always teach about conflict rather than violence. Right. Will I successfully save my friends? Let's roll the dice. Will this fruit successfully come out of the ground when I pull it? Let's roll the dice. Right. Will I have a good a good sleep? in the nighttime uh, before my big performance in front of this tough crowd. Let's roll the dice and find out, right? So no matter what it is, it doesn't have to be violent, um, all kinds of ways, right? To flavor your D&D experience. Um, so let's transition now to thinking about your own roles as teachers, as well as Dungeons and Dragons enthusiasts. One of the things I noticed in both of our previous D&D X ILA events was kind of a cross-cutting theme of here's why D&D is awesome and why you should play it with your students, right? And while I'm personally inclined to agree that it is awesome in many ways, I also wondered if we, as a collective party of heroes, could do more to support teachers for whom maybe the full-on Dungeons and Dragons experience um, might feel a little too high of a barrier to entry. Um, DMing and even prepping the game, even for those of us that have been doing it for a long time, can be pretty time consuming and energy consuming after all. And teachers do have quite a bit on their plates as it is. Um, so instead, what I would like to use this time to do is to invite us to draw out some lessons and inspiration from our D, D experiences with our students that other folks might use to rethink or reshape or even completely transform uh, existing classroom practices and structures. In other words, what can D, D teach us about being better writing teachers for the purposes of today's webinar? And how can teachers start to apply these points of inspiration on Monday morning when they meet their students? So let me start out by asking this. A big part of Dungeons and Dragons is character backstories, right? Uh, the stories that lead our heroes to their current uh, predicaments or positions. What I'm curious about is, have any of you had any experience inspired by character backstories um, to incorporate some lessons about personal narrative or memoir or even identity? in your classrooms? I'll go last. I think this is, oh, sorry, go Cade, go Cade. No, I'll, I'll go last, please. Cade's okay. last in the initiative order today. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> I am actually um, the leader think... now. <laughs> this, this is pretty much exactly what I did to engage my students in writing a few years ago when I had a very young year two class. So uh, here in uh, the States that I'm in, year two is uh, about, eight years of age for students and I had a class of students uh, that just really weren't enjoying writing and it was around the same time that I had been playing d, d for only about six months so I was very new to it not an expert but as soon as I realized that d, d is essentially fun storytelling I knew this would be a good way to hook the kids in I like the idea that dice rolling reduces cognitive load around decision making because when students are writing stories, they've got spelling and punctuation and sentence structure and then 
actually figuring out what's going on. And for a, a young mind, that's a very complex load to take on when you're writing something. So the idea that the decision-making process around can my character do these things is left up to the die takes that away and it creates so much fun when it either works or it doesn't work. One of my first experiences when I was playing D&D was, can I jump on that table and flip over and shoot my arrow at the same time because I think that's the only way I can do it? And the DM said, roll the dice. (laughs) And and I did it. It worked really well to the point where the whole party was like, and that's what you get in the classroom. So it doesn't feel like this onerous experience of writing. So I took it through a scaffold Uh, here in Australia. We have terms of learning and then breaks of holidays. So this was a 10 week unit of work. And obviously I had told the kids a basic description of what D&D is, how much fun I was having. And when you bring that passion, obviously kids get engaged. And I started off with a scaffold just like this, just a template and said, make a character. And so I gave them that scaffold of, you know, name, age, their skills, what do they look like? And then they got to have fun just Googling characters that would look like that. So this particular one, she said, she looks like an ice princess, terrible grammar in there as well. But She wanted to sit down and write, and that was the main thing. And that turned into let's turn our character into something else. So we got more detail. They got to pick little satchels. Some of them picked familiars, and this was before I'd even exposed them to the idea of familiars. And this was the class party by the end of it. So they had put all this work in. They were doing writing. They didn't think they were doing writing. And then collectively in their groups created these character backstories. I won't read them out to you, but I'm happy to share them uh, with the ILA team if they want to share them out to everyone. But the fact that kids started exposing themselves to vocab, because when you think, if you're brand new, you think Lord of the Rings language, tavern, you know, that kind of thing where students I was working with, English wasn't their first language. So this was amazing vocabulary. We hadn't even played a game yet hadn't even played a game. We were just exposing them to this wonderful world of uh, choice and decision making and fun and that rule around fun. And then at the end of it, we took those characters on a little adventure that uh, I had put together with uh, my own DM as well. So if you're sitting there thinking, wow, the boards, the rules, the players, the characters, the backstories, everything. All I did was I took the concept and the inspiration of D&D and how it works and took that into my classroom to engage kids in writing. And believe me, by the end of it, they were so engaged in writing and their skills had developed, obviously, language and sentence structure, all of those things. So that's a good way to approach it if you're thinking, what can I do next? Excellent. Thank you. Hey, listen, I'm going to pull my DM privilege here um, and actually modify the rules. And I may just have one of you, right, respond per initial point that we discussed, just so each of your stories, right, has room to breathe. And then we'll kind of go back to the end and see if there's anything else anybody wants to add on our previous points. And by the way, uh, folks are are just lighting the chat up on fire. So if you are looking for additional ideas, make sure to jump in there as well. So thank you so much, Beck. Really appreciate that. Um, two two big things I heard in your response. On the one hand, uh, we can use uh, things like D&D and role-playing to really change the tasks, right, that we engage our students in, focus on what motivates and interests them. And then the second big thing I heard was we can use these resources to reduce the cognitive load, right? And the cognitive burden that is placed on our students. So that for example, we can first just focus on storytelling and developing our characters. And then maybe later, let's come back and like clean up the grammar and and do that. The heavy editing that may initially feel less motivating, but once you've got a cool story in front of you, might might be a little more fun. So, excellent. Let me ask our two, one of our two remaining panelists, um, improvisation is a huge part of Dungeons and Dragons, as you all saw, right, in our initial, our initial little demo here. Yes And, in particular, is one of the most important improv games uh, that you include in your uh, 
in your practice of playing Dungeons and Dragons, right? Building on what somebody has said and adding to that rather than negating it. Uh, so either Cade or Marianne, can you share a bit about how improvisation uh, has played a role in your own writing instruction? Sure. Ahead, um, I also, I've been keeping an eye on the chat. And one of the things that I see in there that I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get into or not um, is about how to do this with larger groups of children. And there's a lot of, we can maybe throw some ideas around, but I think any one of us is happy to think that through with you on an individual basis afterwards also because the way I would handle that with eight-year-olds is different than the way I would handle it with 16-year-olds. So it may not be worth our time here to try to generalize, but I'm certainly happy to talk it through and I'm sure Kate or Beck would be as well. Uh, so I think, I think that, you know, the, the dice rolling of role-playing games forces you to be creative because you, of course you want to win, but when you lose, it's just as funny, right? When you are supposed to be crossing a mud puddle and you suddenly roll a one and suddenly everyone's falling into the mud puddle, it's not the story you expected, but that's what kind of bonds everyone together and makes it really funny. Um, I think the challenge of writing the, 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 both the sort of pain and joy of writing is that you have to articulate your ideas really clearly and choose a few words to describe the thinking, right? And you're, you're a narrator, you're often characters, you're thinking about your audience. So this is a pretty complex thinking task that we're asking kids to do. And role-playing games really lend themselves to being able to think in a lot of different perspectives at once. You're yourself as you, the kid, you're the player who wants to be able to get past the mud puddle to the castle, and you're also the in-fiction character. And so this helps think about things in lots of different ways and allows for you to make decisions as a writer that you might not be able to do just at, when you're in yourself as yourself, if that makes any sense. Um, the other thing, that having a game like this does is it creates an affinity group and something where everyone has a shared experience because now we all fell in that mud puddle together and it was really stupid and then the prince walked by and he laughed at all of us and it was hilarious, right? And so we have this in fiction shared experience that allows for us to take risks with each other because writing is also about taking risks. And so, so this is not exactly what you were asking, but I think all this positionality is really important behind the scenes. Now we've really set ourselves up to be able to do things like improv, riff on each other, say, oh, that's a good idea. And now that we're getting out of the mud puddle, let's all roll around and we'll pretend we're mud people and then we'll scare the prince and steal his clothes, right? And so each person has a chance to say yes and to each other and build on each other. and. One of the things I find really remarkable about that is that some of the kids who have the most interesting ideas are not always the kids that you would think of as your traditional academic leaders. So it levels the playing field in a different way because you've got that kid with the wacky idea about becoming mud people and scaring the prince and suddenly your straight A students like, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, we're going to do that. And so it's not the same voices all of the time. So those are some of the ways that I think improv and role-playing games sort of positions the class to be able to be better writers and, and community members. Yes, love it. So powerful. So a couple, couple of things I heard in there. One, uh, encourage your students to take perspectives other than their own, right? Um, I also heard, hey, maybe let's not be so afraid of failure. Let's maybe not be so afraid of things going wrong because that's just another way for us to make our stories more interesting. Well, um, and Wizards of the Coast Police don't come and get you if you homebrew the rules to make it work for your classroom or ooh, they haven't found me yet. We're going to get to that as well. So so keep this keep this in the back of your mind, folks, when we get to, to the rules. Now, listen, before we get to homebrewing rules, uh, Kate, I want to bring you in to talk 
a little bit about world building, right? You're, listen, you're a long time dungeon master. You're training young dungeon masters in your students. But part of doing that in D&D is actually creating a world for people to live in uh, and play in and adventure in. And hey, when you're a writer, whether you're doing fiction or informational text, you're kind of doing some world building of your own. So would you care to share a bit about world building, writing, and how the two of those work together to help students? Oh, I think we still have you on mute, sorry. It's gotta happen one, folks, my bad, my once bad, per webinar. It's my, it's my first time, that's my first day. Um, I drop plates in the kitchen too. Um, so yeah, world building is going to be very much in a gaming session, uh, the exclusion of the dungeon master, right? They're going to be the ones that really have to world build while you're at gameplay. But um, what I've noticed in the, the post writing activities that I have my kids do after gameplay, which I don't do anymore, but I did do that for a couple of years. And that was really, really solid that the kids were not always exactly sure of the world that they were playing. And even though their dungeon masters were doing quite a good job of setting that up, they still, as players in writing, had to deduct a lot of information about the world that was left out of the details. Um, world building is not just the world that you play in or live in, but it's the world that, you know, you as a player have to be able to imagine while you're going through sequences. And so the ma imagination is a metacognitive uh, element in the mind. The, ma the imagination thinks about what it thinks about. And so if you're talking about creating setting in a story, for instance, which is so important, um, at the beginning of every character's backstory, which my kids are now just finishing their model of the hero's journey, which is in lots of curriculums all over the world for the first nine weeks of school, well, their call to adventure from their background to their character class has an adventure to it, right? Like, how did you go from being a hermit to being you know, a ranger? How did you go from being an acolyte to being a cleric? Like what happened to make you leave that institution to go about? Well, there is world building in that. And even if the world is central around the character, and this is why I feel that's important as a teacher is because if a character, if a player can do that with their character and create agency of a world around their character that their character can interact with and understand, that means then that that player the child using the same system is capable of world building themselves around themselves. Now, this doesn't have a lot to do with writing necessarily. This has more to do with the metacognition that children learn by playing this game, which of course writing, all that does is that's one more metacognitive step, right? So metacognition is the knowing what you know and knowing what you don't know. And so if they reach limits a lot where they're like, ah, I just don't know, that means that their their world building tool is is weak, um, and this is probably is not the greatest description of of what you're asking for for world building. But this is my experience as a teacher who's been doing this for ten years. The kids do have a problem identifying the world that they exist in and have trouble activating themselves within this world. And so the the practice that they get playing D and D and all of the things that we've discussed over these panels that have come with it. Um, the world building, of course, like you, you have to have a place to live, right? Um, and if you want to talk about the more traditional literary approach of world building, when students are writing stories, they very much have to create a setting, right? Well, are you in the woods? Are you in a swamp? Are you in a cave? And I think that we think of world building as like, what is the campaign setting, right? Are we in Faroon? Are we in Dragonlance? Guys, that's way too much for an individual student player to deal with in a writing task. You want it like, okay, I live in the woods of Neverwinter, in the Neverwinter woods, and like, you know, create a village. That's enough, right? They know that their domain is the Neverwinter woods. What does your village look like? So you really want to scale down into a microscopic sort of, you know, pinpoint where you're focusing students' attention on their storyline. And I've been doing this for a week now as the kids are finishing their hero's journey called to adventure, where it's like, Mr. Wells, and I show them Faroon, and I have the map, you know, the area of Fandelver. It's such a great, great map. And um, they, they have so many questions in regard to this very small area. And they're like, well, where's my village at? I'm like, your village is wherever you want it to be, dude. So like, look at the map and pick a spot where your little elven village is. And that's what world building really is on this, on this level for students needing to activate their characters for writing. And um, it's, it's remarkably successful because here they are, these little nerds looking at this map. And they're like, ah, I think I want to be from the end of this fork of the river. Okay, what's the name of the town? How many people live there? Is there a mayor, a king, or a noble lord? Are there other people besides elves that live there? 
are there, you know, other, other villages nearby? And they're like, oh, you know, so those little wheels of cognition, um, it takes little questions sometimes to drop in. And of course, that's what dungeon masters do. And so that's my sort of interactive experience to world building because I couldn't ever just allow the time for them to like sit and build a whole world. It's more these little pinpoints of like, they want details and they want little pieces of information to bring their story to life. And they think that they don't know this fantasy world that they've never read about, right, Faroon? Well, guys, it's just a map with a forest. You know, like, what do you want to be in the forest? Is it owl bears? Is it goblins? Is it hobgoblins? Like, what's the immediate threat to your community? Is it another community? Whatever it is. And so the, the world building, as we understand it as, like, English teachers, is it looks a little different in D&D because it's so much more interactive. Got it. Love that. Right. And, you know, just to clarify, I definitely know like right or wrong answers here. I don't have like an ideal set of answers in my head. So I really appreciate everything you shared. Three things that stood out to me in particular. One, it was encouraging student agency, right? Listen, it's your world. It's your essay. It's your story, right? You have to decide what happens next. And how often do our students come to us, right? Uh, needing some support for that agency. Um, I also heard the importance of sweating the small details, right? Sometimes it's those little things, right? Little descriptions, little facts uh, that can make a big difference in our writing. So encouraging students, right? Sometimes to sweat the, the small stuff. Uh, and then lastly, right? You mentioned metacognition, knowing what we know and knowing what we don't know, right? Such a huge part of that writing process. So thank you for all that. Um, let me take it back to either Marianne or Rebecca, because we can't talk about writing without talking about assessment and evaluation. But that kind of stuff sometimes looks different in the Dungeons and Dragons world versus uh, the world of school. So, for example, uh, there is something within D&D culture. I don't think this is in the rule book, but there's something within D&D culture called the rule of cool. And the way the rule of cool works is if your players decide and describe uh, an action or a series of actions they'd like to take that is just so absolutely over the top, wacky, entertaining, or just plain genius, we don't even touch the die. We don't even open the rule book. It's a success because that's amazing and we're going to see it happen. We don't often see the rule of cool applied in our schools where we're constrained by standardized tests and rubrics and, and kind of many other, right, evaluative techniques. So Marianne or, or Beck, do either of you have any thoughts on how using the rule of cool might help us rethink the way that we teach and the way that we assess writing? I think if, if Marianne wants to get to specific rule of cool, I'm going to give a bit of a prelude to it because before you can get to sort of that rule, there needs to be that um, environmental expectation that we're doing this together, that we're, we're at school together, our classroom is togetherness. Like you don't need to give it words like family tribe or anything like that, but it's around building that expectation and that culture that we're all different we're all acceptable the way that we are. The way that I ran that writing program was all around supporting kids to be collaborative when they created those characters. And I think that stuff is a good step that needs to happen before you can get to the rule of call because without those fundamentals that sit underneath it, it, it will not um, be as successful as it can be without setting that stuff up in your classroom first. And that comes down to building relationships and, and, and putting in the time for that. And, and someone who is an instructional leader myself, I know how hard driven we can be from the top down around assessment and rigor and results, but I think it pays to take a step back and take the time to put into those relationships, those expectations and building that culture so that the rule of cool can work really well. And I'll pass that to Mary and so you, I think you might have some good examples there. <laughs> oh man, well, I love the teamwork. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. And um, this idea of affinity groups I was talking about earlier, I didn't make it up. It's a John Paul G thing. And it's this idea of creating a group of people who have a shared experience, even though they might not have other things in common. And it can be something that happens online or in a classroom. This is that affinity group. We all have this shared fictional experience. 
And that helps everyone buy in because they all want the world to succeed. They want the story to be a good story and not a boring story. Um, and that's for me where rule of cool comes in. You can certainly have any style of writing come out of this. I saw in the chat, someone was talking about newspaper articles, right? From maybe from the point of view of the of the citizens of the town who the travelers went through their town. You could do like nonfiction style reports on monsters. You could do directions for how to play and then all the sort of fictional backstory things. Um, you could do reports. And so for me, part of that rule of cool is I might have certain things I need to show, like growth and grammar or something, but it can be about anything. So why don't I have it be about something that kids actually want to write about, the, right? Their fictional character or the monster or the bad guy or whatever, who cares? And rule of cool is certainly very much it's about telling a good story, right? Nobody wants to tell a story where once upon a time, nothing happened. That's like Tuesday afternoon, right? Like in real life. So if somebody wants to come up with a creative um, answer, I saw in the chat, someone had like uh, learned in science that water expands when it's frozen. So they froze water inside of a dragon's head and the dragon's head exploded. That's a story from our chat. Like, yes right? Why am I going to say no to that? Because now everyone in the class is going to remember that water expands because they blew up a dragon with it, right? And so that's kind of what Rule of Cool is about. It's about having that trust and that affinity grouping in your classroom and then using that to get out of it the things that you need to get out of it. D&D &D in the classroom is not like a free-for-all, right? And, and it is different then when you play it at home and you can do basically whatever you want, whatever sort of the table will abide. It's fine to have it directed towards the standards that you have to have done, right? But you can do persuasive essays, you can do um, informational text, you can do whatever you want with it, but this gives you a more authentic feeling reason to do it. And that's for me what the rule of cool is. Love it. Love the the foundations, right? That you uh, that you mentioned, right? The importance of setting back, and then of course, uh, Marianne really just kind of breaking down that dichotomy between standards and fun stuff, right? It doesn't it doesn't need to be there. We can be rigorous with our students and also engage them in in, in transformative experiences. Speaking of which, uh, can you all believe we've got about 15 minutes left in our chat? Uh, so, Kate, let me let me bring it over to you. And I'll, I'd like to invite you to talk a little bit about real world impact of some of this stuff on your own students and maybe tie that a little bit for when we speak to our administrators and other folks that we have to convince we've got a role for persuasion. Um, how is it that we bring up some of these ideas and, and, and introduce folks that may not be quite as familiar with the impact of these practices on our students? Um, the quick answer is I have got a reading chart that was tracked over the last three years of my kids playing D&D with me in my classroom, Adam, from sixth grade to eighth grade. Their um, reading score doubled just about every time they took a test. Doubled. Now, like doubling, like that's crazy. It's crazy. Not okay. So one time, right, they got good in it my my graph goes up to the upper right hand corner where the normal mean kind of you know gently increases this was like a dramatic growth after three years of having these same kids and the similar sort of writing instructional practices and using DD &D and the sort of whole class because like when we play DD &D in my room that's great but like the whole room emulates a DD &D experience in some way because i want to be able to have fun in my room and uh yeah there it is thanks thanks wes look at you man look at you go yeah, the purple line is me and my kids after three years. And like, it's just insane. And then the observed growth with my name there next to it, that 3.9 to 6.9 to 12.9 to 20.25, you got to be kidding me. Like, this is unprecedented stuff. This this came from not just Dungeons and Dragons, but like the learning that comes from the awakening is what my principal, Micah Fesler, would say. The awakening that this game creates in children allows this sort of growth to take place inside the brain. Um, this has to do with the basic psychology of the of the synaptic path, 
Okay, so you start with a minimum maintenance road that eventually gets gravel, then it gets tar, and then it's a highway, then it's a you know, then it's an interstate, and that's literally what happens when they're when they're playing the game. Um, that's the real world application is that you're basically taking the theoretical component of the brain and you're waking it up and get, making it able to con con uh, communicate with the technical side of the brain. And when anybody who plays the indie knows that those two parts of the brain have to interact constantly, and then you have to verbalize your intent which has to be listened to, to be understood, which then goes back through the brain, back through the theoretical, to the concrete, and then out again. And every single person has to do this around the table every time they take a turn. And while they're waiting for their turn, they still have to wait and listen in response for those things to happen. So that's like the, the brain science behind this very simple principle. And like, you know, if a principal can't understand that, I don't know, maybe they need to look for another job or something. Um, the, one of the things I wanted to bring up in terms of real world stuff, Earl, is that uh, people are asking about standards. So for high school, where you do standard based assessment, how could this be implemented, especially since it's non standard instruction, I have to stop there and tell you this is standardized instruction. Okay, like, you hand a player's handbook to a, a, a resistant administrator with a character sheet and say, go ahead and do it by yourself. It's not hard. Just go ahead and make this character all by yourself. You shouldn't need any help because this is non-standard instruction, right? Like, this doesn't matter. This is easy. They can't do it. They will, they will take them weeks to be able to make a character. They'd have to read the whole player's handbook. So even just that has been great uh, and powerful for me with resistant parents, resistant administration. It's like, hey, dude, like, if this is so easy and so, like, not worthwhile for kids to be able to play this game, maybe you can show me how brilliant you are and make this character by yourself. And they can't, of course. And then they look at the, and then all of a sudden they turn the page and then all the stuff comes to light. We're like, oh, strength, dexterity, intelligence, wisdom, charisma. Like these are awesome words. Well, you, you're, like I've said before, you're not even seeing, you're, you're, the iceberg is on the horizon. You're not even really looking at it yet. Like this is the, the tip, tip, tip of the iceberg. Um, my kids' reading growth shows what this does. That tracking over the last three years was awesome. In Houston, when I taught Title I, the growth was very similar. Their numbers were lower because they're Title I kids, but the growth was similar. When you're talking about doubling numeric values for test data out of a Title I school, like you have found something really, really magical. And I want to reiterate one more time that Dungeons and Dragons, I have gone through the power standards that we use for grading. It absolutely fulfills over half of the English standards that I am supposed to assess as an administrator. I created a rubric very recently for gameplay that has five standards that they do just when they're playing the game every single time. And my dungeon masters keep score of those kids. And so here you have a social expectation where, yeah, you don't just get to sit at this game table and do nothing. Um, you're going to be assessed on your participation within this group by the person who's running this group, who is an expert at running the group. They are going to know better than anybody how to assess you. And those assessments indicate like how good of a, of a relatable person you are. Like how much do you care about this group? Can you invest in something that is imaginary? And I'm sure everyone would understand this day and age. It is difficult for students occasionally to invest in imagination like it's they're they're too cool to do it right like a resistant student is usually going to be somebody like that it's not going to be the kid who struggled at everything they're going to be fully invested okay that kid that's always hated everything in your class or other classes they're all in like they're going to go through this horrible struggle that that's painful for them because they probably lead read low and things like that they are going to love it. And here it's going to be Susie Q, who's always been good at everything, who's going to hate it because all of a sudden she's not as smart as she thought she is. We're talking about real world application. And so you allowed me to go down the highway there. I'm telling you, these are the things that I've experienced. Um, when we're talking about writing and D&D, &D, like it's really, really easy to include writing into a D&D &D, uh, scholastic you know, system. Like my kids do a head to toe description of character. It's a one page sentence variety. That's the mission for grammar is to write different sentences. They color code it. So when they're done, they look at it and they can see the different types of sentences that they have. That's their head to toe description. That they read the first time they meet everybody at the party. They do a backstory, which is the call to adventure, right? That's in the canon for, you know, the assessment for my school. And then they do a heroic bio poem because you're not going to read your whole backstory when you meet somebody in the tavern for the first time. You're going to say, I am Gimli, son of Gloin, you know, and a few things, right? So you're using their writing to create more writing, which is actually really, really powerful because usually they're used to using other people's writing to have to inform their own writing. So again, we're creating player agency, um, creating player choice. This all boils down to the student ends up feeling really, really powerful about who they are and what they can do in the world that is theirs, as well as the imaginary world, which you've provided for them. Oh uh, man, love it. Can I, can I add on to that? Please. So 
I'm a bard at heart. <laughs> and um, I, everything Cade has said is 100% true. When I come in, I say, you got to know your audience, right? So what does your audience want? And when I talk about it with parents or I talk about it with administrators, I talk about it differently than I talk about it with kids. And I say, hey, I'm going to use a pedagogy that impacts social emotional learning, increases collaboration and community in the classroom, increases engagement, flexible thinking, and 21st century skill set. How does that sound? And they're like, okay. I'm like, yeah, we're going to do collaborative storytelling. We're going to use creativity. We're going to go through all sorts of different genres of writing, especially the one that's for this grade level. Right. That's because if I go in like, hey, let's kill some demons and, right. and you know, use some math rocks, that's not going to do it. So, so, you know, uh, for my superintendent, there's research that I can use there. And so a lot of this is like, how do you use your bard skills to sell it by helping highlight the things that you, your audience wants and needs? I'm not saying make stuff up. This is all stuff that's actually going to happen. But the what Kate is saying about the brain science, that might work really, really well with your superintendent, but might not work so well with the parent that's worried about the satanic panic, right? I saw that in the chat. That is not something, I'm in New England, in New Hampshire. That's not actually something that I've come across. Um, I know that other people in other parts of the country may have a different experience. But ever since Stranger Things came out, everybody's kind of over it. Powerful. Thank you. Uh, Beck, I'm going to bring you in for the last word on inclusion, right? Uh, Kate and, and Marianne, you, you both alluded to something really important, right? D&D isn't magic. It doesn't cause these amazing gains to happen in our students, but it opens up some really important spaces of possibility, right? For our students to step into and for us to step into. But as we all know, who have had good and not so good experiences playing the game, right? Uh, it's not an automatically inclusive experience. There's so much that needs to be done by the person running the game and by the people participating to make sure everybody feels included. So going to one of the questions in the chat, I'll read it and it says, I've had a hard time getting kids to participate in anything lately. I've been getting more and more silent students, maybe because our school has declared to be an inclusive school. I'm hoping to use D&D to bring particular silent kids out of their shell. Suggestions are open. So, Beck, would you mind sharing a bit about D&D &D inclusiveness and how we can invite more participation in the space? I think I have a good literal example there where one of the students that was in my class when I did that unit was diagnosed with selective mutism and was able to participate in a variety of ways. And of course, that comes down to a lot of teacher strategies and what we put in our class to make sure students feel like they can contribute in a way that supports them and is successful for them. And I think the, the basis that I was first introduced to D&D &D with is if you're not having fun, then the game isn't being played properly. Um, that idea that there, yes, there are rules, but there's kind of no rule at the same time is that there's a lot of things within our scope where we can make those choices or if we're struggling to make choices, the die roll will help us um, do that. The fact that things that are kind of out of our control means that we can um, laugh at ourselves when things go funny. So when we were rolling before for initiative and it was a four, oh, well, it's, it's not my skill set. It has nothing to do with me or poor decision making or who I am as a person that separate die over there that did it for me it it's really weird because it can create this sense of ownership without having massive weight of responsibility at the same time and so again as you said it's not it's not a magic pill but I think the fact that you've you've got rules to work with if you need that for kids that need structure and support but there's also this freedom for those kids that feel smothered by structure and rules and support that allow that openness as well and you don't need to be an expert in all of uh, the books and the rules and everything in the history and the law to be able to do that there's just this general understanding that as Cade said this is the world that we're in 
and you have flexibility or you have structure depending on how you do it. So again, this comes back to knowing your kids, knowing your kids well, knowing how they learn, knowing how they interact. And for that specific question that was in the chat too, we still need to remember we're living in, in the COVID crazy world still and our kids have taken on a lot of trauma. So we can't just go, okay, well, we're back to school. I've got this great D&D thing. Why isn't it working? We've got to remember there's a lot going on underneath for our kids at the moment too. So uh, taking into account all those different things that are going on, sometimes D&D is a great escape or sometimes it could be a great vessel to have some of those difficult conversations about challenges. So I would I would be really analyzing your kids and where they're at and what will support them best because having this open world of D&D means you have lots of choices on what you can do to support those kids. So as Earl said before, he didn't script anything when we started today. We just went with the flow. Sometimes kids can't do that. Sometimes they need the script. So if that means you think your kids are going to need a couple of dot points about what your characters can and can't do, um, choices they could make, things that they could do, you would set that up for your kids. However, if you've got that really confident kid that loves to be out there and try anything and everything, let them go for gold and just feel the vibe and support the kids as they go. And one thing I'll leave it off on is uh, touch base with your kids afterwards. Check in that they are actually having fun. Um, check in that they're enjoying it, that they're not struggling with their decisions. Don't just leave it and go, yeah, everyone had a laugh. That was a great time. Check in and reflect. And someone even said in the chat as well about using some Socratic methods. That is a great opportunity for kids to come out and go, yeah, do you know what? Actually, that was very difficult for me making a decision to do this part of the game. Or I was really frustrated that uh, the party wasn't listening to my contributions when I suggested something and I felt really overshadowed because then you teacher as the DM would be able to keep that in mind for the next game and help facilitate that. And it gives kids that option to go. Um, I'm, I need to let the group know that I'm not actually having fun. And the first rule is we're meant to be having fun. You know, that's not me not liking you. It comes back to that first rule of D&D that we're meant to be having fun. I could not come up with a better end to this webinar if I had scripted it. Thank you so, so much for that. Listen, y'all, we are out of time. So let me just finish by thanking you so much, both our presenters and everybody who has joined us and just bombarded the chat with resources. I hope you all rewatch this video. Make sure to download the chat before you go because there's so much in there. And listen, before everybody goes, just a brief reminder, the first two webinars of this sponsored series in collaboration with our partners, Wizards of the Coast, are available on demand and can be accessed by visiting literacyworldwide.org backslash uh, digital events. Please keep an eye on the ILA digital events webpage, literacyworldwide.org backslash digital events for additional on-demand content and, of course, upcoming webinars and learning opportunities. Last but not least, if you're not already following ILA on social media, please make sure to hit that follow button uh, to keep up to date on um, all the information that we've got coming up for y'all. So with that, once again, thank you. Have an amazing rest of your day, and we will see you in a future webinar.